Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending February 25th. First up, this one was from uh, Mick C. And thank you to everybody that has sent in uh, so many topics. I'm only going to be able to cover partially this week, so I've got more topics for next week out of even what I have now. But don't stop sending them in. I can always use new ones. This is from AFR Weekend. This is an Australian newspaper. Silicone will blow lithium batteries out of water, says Adelaide Firm now. Uh, before you get your hopes up that you're going to have silicone batteries in your uh, laptop, not real likely. These are more for commercial use, and I'll tell you why in a minute. An Adelaide company has developed a silicone storage device that it claims costs a tenth as much as lithium ion battery to store the same energy and is eyeing a $10 million public float. That's $10 million Australian. Uh, probably that would be about maybe $8 million American, I'm guessing. 1414 Degrees has its origins in a patented CSIRO research and has built a prototype molten silicone storage device which it is testing. Now what this does is it does phase change. It goes from molten to uh, solidifying and as it gives up uh, the it gives up 36 times as much energy as a typical uh, well I'll read here. Chairman Kevin Moriarty says 1414 degrees process can store 500 kilowatt hours of energy in a 70 centimeter cube of molten silicone about 36 times as much energy as Tesla's 14 kilowatt hour power wall to lithium ion home storage battery in about the same space. Put another way, he says the company can build 10 megawatt hour storage device for about $700,000. Um, the 714 Tesla Power Wall would be needed, uh, 2S that would be needed to store that same amount of energy would cost $7 million. So, yeah, they're going to save about 10, uh, one tenth the cost if, if what they say is true. But the other thing, too, is um, I don't think it's very likely that in a home setting or in your laptop setting, you're going to store molten silicone. So uh, for industrial uses, I can see this being something very useful. But uh, no, unless they can come up with another way to make it safer or to control it a little bit better, this is not going to be something that the average consumer I can see using any time in the near future. Um, this one was from Tom H. Uh, from Fox News, seven new Earth-like exoplanets discovered NASA announces. This has been all over Facebook and all the social media and stuff like that, but in case you haven't heard about it, there are uh, seven Earth-sized planets, approximately Earth-sized, and three of them are in the habitable zone, and that's the habitable zone zone meaning a place where liquid water can exist although there's no way knowing right now with what they know about them do they know they have any liquid water or not and as one scientist said too on a radio show uh, remember also the moon is in the habitable zone too it circles around the earth and it's well within the habitable zone but uh, there's no life that we know of on the moon so just because it's in the habitable zone and it's large and round but the other neat thing about this too is these seven planets are so close together that if you were standing on one of these planets you would actually see another planet that was as big or bigger than the moon which I think is kinda neat too having a planet be that close whereas uh, basically you know the, the planets we see now like Mars and Jupiter and stuff like that in the sky basically are just bright stars for our vision we don't see them as large round planets and stuff don't know what effect that would have in the future of the orbitals too. I've heard other planetary scientists say that this this can't exist for a real long time too because planets being that close would destabilize each other, destabilize each other's orbit, or they would uh, eventually swap places, collide, different things like that could happen. So I don't know how stable of a system this is too. That even if it had all the necessary ingredients of an atmosphere and water and stuff like that, would it still be the kind of place that was stable enough to uh, harbor? Um, any kind of life forms or anything like that, even the simplest kind. We do not know yet, but anyway, this is interesting news. And uh, this happens to be uh, 40 light, 400 light years? Well, how is it? 40. This is 40 light years away that these planets exist. So if you get a chance to check out these uh, articles, I will have the links. And by the way, I'll have all the links to all these articles down below in the description. And then this one is from, let me get the name right, yes, from Joseph L., uh, this is just a video on YouTube, but it kind of blends into another article uh, that was on uh, uh, Science Friday. Do robots deserve rights? What if machines become conscious? Conscious, and I will uh, I'll try to pronounce this channel, but it's called Kurz Jesagd or something like that. In a nutshell, that's the name of the channel name. I won't try to pronounce it again, but uh, basically, it's talking about too that will robots get so advanced and so sentient that will they will deserve uh, their own rights and um, I don't know. You can discuss it in the comments if it, you know, if it, if you feel that it's um, something you want to discuss. But yeah, will we reach the point? Is it is it going to reach a certain point to where complexity of an electronic machine can be such to where it can actually be self-aware? I mean, that's the kind of thing from uh, 
the Terminator series and stuff like that too, that, you know, all of a sudden Skynet becomes self-aware. And how do we even really know what self-aware is too? I mean, as far as if you want to get into deep philosophy, you can't be sure that the person sitting next to you is self-aware. They act like they're self-aware, but there's no inherent way you're going to know if they feel things exactly the way you do or are they just imitating it. And that's what I wonder about machines and robots. If we program emotions into them so that they behave like we behave, will it be they're just doing it out of the programming and they don't really feel sorrow, they don't really feel hurt, they don't really feel joy and happiness, they're just programmed to mimic those emotions? How would you ever know it was real? And then jumping to the uh, uh, the public radio show um, on point they had uh, one historian's brief history of tomorrow where he talks about the fact that human beings have uh, thought of themselves in history especially the aristocracy and people that are ruling over other people think of themselves as being better but there's no physical thing about them that makes them any better than just like he said the king is just as uh, vulnerable and just about the same as the ordinary peasant as far as having any extra powers but that could change in the future as people enhance themselves and it says right here at the beginning if man and machine really do become one will destroy democracy humanism will it destroy uh, they didn't write this right but I'll correct it will it destroy democracy humanism and our souls one historian's view of the future and you can actually it's a 47 minute interview and it's very interesting this is an author that has also wrote a book called homo deus and he says to be human once meant a good chance of suffering brought on by the very experience of being human but looking back at our history and had to rapid change author yuval noah harari sees a future of widespread dramatic technological change rapidly growing life expectancy a world where a lot of our biggest challenges are licked. Being human is really going to change this hour on point. Homo Deus setting up a new age for humankind. And you can either, um, well, you can basically just click on the little um, triangle up at the top and uh, listen to it. Or if you've got to download it like I do, you can even download it and listen to it later. But uh, yeah, on point is a very good uh, science program that I listen to quite often. And he brings up some really good points here too. And I was always thinking about the fact, will we split off into two types of... Uh, I don't know if you can really call it humans, but two types of uh, beings to where we have the old style humans that want to stay mostly, if not all, uh, biological, and then the other kind of humans that want to enhance themselves either uh, electronically, mechanically, or with biological enhancements and be enhanced uh, human beings. I mean, that may be the, the sign of where our, you know, humanity is going because uh, if things can be done, they pretty much will be done. And if the people are rich enough to do it, you may have people that are very wealthy be able to enhance their bodies and people that don't quite have the money not be able to do it. Another guest, actually, they, they had call-ins on this show, too, and another guy brought up the, the idea, too, that he said, well, it may actually, you know, um, not be that way because just like things like pacemakers and stuff like that were very expensive at first and now it's pretty much anybody in the middle class. I, I know lots of people that have pacemakers and stuff like that. So yeah, maybe the rich people get it at first, but then later as uh, science advances and the cost goes down and they make more of them and they get better, smaller and cheaper, uh, it may be that all these enhancements or stuff like that will be open to just uh, the individual middle class person. So who knows where future can go? It's like where is the crystal ball? What would your guess be? You know, put it down in the comments if you want to. Uh, where do you think we're going, and what is what is our end game going to be? Are we going to be sitting around as people uh, having robots uh, serve us and take care of us, or are we going to be uh, the robots ourselves, or at least cyborgs, enhanced human beings? So anyway, that's about enough for uh, this week. And take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.